Everybody seeing the slides? Yes. All right, Thank perfect. You. All right, yeah, uh, so thanks again for having me. Um, pleasure to be here, pleasure to talk about uh, this. So I'm, I'm going to give a talk about, um, about Snowflake, in particular how uh, we use metadata management to do certain, certain operations, to accelerate certain operations, and a little bit over how we, um, how we, op op uh, how we optimize our data layout and file layout to do performance optimizations. All right, so let's get started. Um, so first, always like the main corporate slides, what is Snowflake? Well, uh, we are a cloud company. We are offering uh, what we call like the, the data cloud, which is essentially like a, a database as a service, like a cloud database as a service product. Um, the company was founded in 2012. So uh, we actually have our 10 year anniversary this year uh, by Terry and Benoit, who are two like industry veterans from, from Oracle. Essentially we're taking a look at how um, during that time as like cloud resources emerged to become very available and very cheap, how people kind of use that to do data processing, particularly looked at something like MapReduce where you can very elastically like scale up your, your operations um, and run like massive scans with only actually the resource that you need for that. And they kind of thought, okay, can we, can we apply something like that to a relational database engine? So can we build a database engine that uses cloud resources in a way that we can elastically basically scale up and down everything? Um, and uh, obviously they, they were successful. So we kind of built like some initial product there. Uh, it was released in 2015 as a general availability. And since then uh, we've, been, we've been growing quite some, uh, quite some numbers. So we have uh, over 6,000 customers now. We have hundreds of petabytes of managed data in our system. Uh, we run millions of jobs per day. Um, and yeah, it uh, seems to be Seems to be like other people actually like the product, which is great. <laughs> so let's take a look at um, how Snowflake actually, what Snowflake actually is and how it's built. So at its core, it is a data warehouse built for the cloud. And as I already said, like the focus in, in the product is, is on elasticity. So uh, we want to be able that customers can basically scale up as quickly as possible to uh, kind of scale up the warehouse as quickly as possible and as, uh, as, as, as efficiently as possible, but also scale them down as quickly as possible. So such that basically their, their spend or their warehouse usage essentially exact, uh, follows exactly their, uh, their demands, like their workload demands. Um, we are running on top of uh, cloud providers. So we're obviously not running, we're not, not using our own data centers. Uh, we're running on top of Amazon on Microsoft and Google. Um, and obviously use cases for the product are, it's, it's in, in, in the end, it's like a data warehouse. So obviously like anything um, like analytical query processing that you can think about. So business intelligence, analytics, reporting, dashboarding, and applications uh, are there. So how does the, how does the architecture look like? So I'm sorry for this like marketing uh, architecture slide here, uh, but it's, uh, it's hard to get like an actual a diagram out uh, by, by our legal team. <laughs> this is kind of like basic, the basic idea here. So the basic idea is that we have three layers at Snowflake. So we have the centralized storage. Think of it like, this is essentially like cloud storage. So think of it like S3 where the actual data resides in. Then we have the compute layer, which is like the middle ring here, uh, which is where customers actually run their queries. And this is, these are run on essentially like, think of it like EC2 boxes that then access the data as needed from the centralized storage and then run queries. And then we have the cloud service layer, which is sitting on top. And this layer is kind of the interaction and the coordination layer where we do deal with kind of queries coming in, we compile the queries there, kind of we do metadata management, transaction management there. Um, and yeah. And the nice thing is that each of these layers are, can scale independently. So we can, I mean, the centralized uh, storage obviously that is given by the cloud uh, provider. So this is like cloud storage, which is essentially infinitely scalable anyways, but the compute layer and the cloud service layer are also built in a way uh, that uh, for the compute layer, customers can just add resources as needed or remove resources as needed, but on a, like on a really like a second latency. And the cloud service layer is built obviously in a way that like we can do metadata, metadata processing that we can do like all kinds of uh, orchestration processing in a way that we can just like add resources and scale this up and down as needed. Um, yeah, this is just like going a little bit into detail there. So the cloud service layer, as I said, this is like a shared layer for all users. So it's kind of a multi-tenant entry point into the system itself. Uh, it's fully managed by us, uh, kind of it kind of provides upgrades, frequent upgrades. So we kind of uh, push a new release of Snowflake every week or so, um, pending testing, how that goes. Uh, it's always on, so customers can always connect and it offers, which is interesting, kind of the, metadata management is kind of sitting in the cloud service layer, not actually in the compute layer. And by metadata management, I'm talking about, and we'll see that a little bit later in this talk, particularly talking about transaction handling and, and how we think about kind of uh, table state and how table state evolves. 
And the cloud service layer also has um, a distributed key value store. And we use foundation to be, and we use that kind of as our, let's call like transactional synchronization backend. So this is how we kind of, we, we manage to do transactions at scale. Uh, then a compute layer. So as I said, this is essentially managed by the customer. Well, it's not managed by the customers, but it's um, it's used by the customers to run queries. So they have this concept of a virtual warehouse, which is essentially like a combination of uh, EC2 boxes that customers can um, can uh, can start. Uh, on these EC2 boxes, we run our own platform, high performance SQL processing engine, which is like a columnar push based parallel data flow engine. Um, each customer has their own cluster and even cluster. So we can have like multiple clusters that access the data and process the queries. And each of these workers in this multi compute, uh, multi cluster compute layer is actually stateless and it's completely decoupled from storage. So storage is not owned by the EC2 machine, storage is always owned uh, by S3 essentially, by the, uh, by the centralized storage. And then the workers, when they actually process a query, they basically fetch what they need from centralized storage and then process the query on, uh, on, on, the, on their machines. And obviously in order to get performance, you have to like play some tricks there. So we, uh, we obviously rely on aggressive caching on these machines. We use, uh, we, use, like, uh, we, use um, we use metadata to figure out which files we actually need to scan from centralized storage. We use uh, data skipping inside our files. So it's kind of a custom file format that allows us to do like partial reads, also like a column of file format. Um, so yeah. That is that. And then centralized storage, as I said, so this is kind of where all of the data is stored. Uh, we support multiple formats of data. So customers can either store relational data, they can use uh, store JSON data, XML data, um, uh, geo data, et cetera. It's all stored in a proprietary file format that is optimized for scan access. So as I was talking before, so we have like a pre-index file, we have columnar access into it. We have fine grade metadata that allows us to figure out whether they actually need to scan a file. And very Important point is that all files that we store are always immutable. Um, that's essentially was a design decision that came out of S3 simply not offering an update command. But it also turns out this really simplifies transaction handling and enables like features like cloning and timetable that I will talk about later. So that is kind of an overview of kind of Snowflake. As I said, like we have these three layers; they are all independent. Uh, they can scale independently. And so let's now take a little bit of like a closer look at how. Um, how data is organized in Snowflake, how tables are organized in Snowflake. So tables in Snowflake, again, like it's a relational system. So our kind of our unit of, of data atomic is like, is a table. Um, it's a relational table. Um, there is like, I mean, you all should be, you all should know what it is. Um, the tables internally are organized into uh, a number of files. We call them micro partitions. Um, I will probably use this the two, the two terms interchangeably throughout the talk. So when I say micro partition, I mean file. When I mean say file, I mean micro partition, as well as metadata about these files. Um, the micro partitions are, as I said, they're immutable and they're kept on cloud storage. Um, they store the actual table data in our proprietary columnar format. And they are limited in size. Uh, the size of each micro partition is typically on the order of 16 megabytes. Sometimes it's a bit bigger, sometimes a bit slower. There are obviously uh, special cases there, but roughly think about like on that order. And uh, metadata is stored separately from the data. So we are, we are keeping that um, essentially like in the, in the central key, uh, key value store. And we use metadata to kind of uh, figure out what is the relationship between tables and, and files or micro partitions. And also like what are the statistics? What is the content of these files? And why we need that, we'll, we'll see in a second. All right. so. Let's place through through some DMLs and see kind of how these uh, these partitions and the metadata snippets evolve and how, kind of what happens when we actually do something on a system. So we have uh, on the left like an empty table. It's just like two columns, uh, ID column and a name column, and we want we'll run three operations. First, we do an initial load, so we copy something into this table. Then we'll do a single row insert into this table, and then we'll delete something from this table. Okay, so let's get started. Um, what happens when we copy into the table? Well, this would essentially mean we will probably read in some CSV file or something, parse that, transform that into our internal, into our internal format, and then create some some partitions that oh, sorry, some micro partitions and files that, that we then write to cloud storage. So this happens kind of in the execution. Let's say for the sake of the argument, here we create two files. So we call partition one and partition two. Uh, partition one contains uh, like the first three rows, partition two contains the second three rows. And um, what we also do when we create these partitions, as I said, we collect metadata about them. So what is this metadata? At its core, it's similar to like a zone map. So think of it like min-max ranges that we keep for all of the columns in the file. And this is like automatically collected as part of the file creation. So in this case, 
for the first partition, we see that the IDs go from uh, one to three and the names go from A to M. So these are prefixes. Um, I think it should probably be M, B or something, but anyway, you, you, you get what I mean. Here. And for the second part, the IDs go from four to six and the names go from F to T, right? And then what we do is we kind of uh, package up this information that we added to partitions plus the metadata for these partitions and store that kind of in a central metadata store. So now the, meta, the metadata entry, they have like we had this metadata snippet on the right. So we see we added these two partitions and obviously these would then be kind of, let's say links to locations in cloud storage. Uh, we deleted nothing and here are the statistical information about what content is stored in these two partitions. And this metadata snippet is then written to our central key value store where it can be accessed. So let's now say we uh, want to insert a row. So we already have our two partitions on the left side and we now want to insert a new row. Again, this is going into the execution. So the execution will create a new file. As you remember, files are always immutable. So in this case, we'll just add like a new file that just contains the single row. Obviously in practice, we will probably merge files together to avoid like having very small files. But for the sake of the argument, let's say we create like a single row file here. Um, so we create this file, we, again, we collect the metadata here. The ID is just one, so it goes from seven to seven and the name uh, goes from M to M. And we again, like create a metadata snippet and insert it into the key value store. And here we added like partition three and our statistics for these files go from seven to seven and from M to M. All right, so far so good. Let's now say we want to delete from something. Um, so this is obviously a little bit more interesting because as I said, uh, partitions are immutable. So we can't just go in and update partition two. Instead, we obviously what we do is we do use copy on write. So we create a new partition by we just basically scan partition two, which contains uh, Neda, who we want to delete. And then we rewrite a new partition that only contains like Terry and Gloria. So we add now add a partition four. Again, we collect metadata about it. So now the partition four, the IDs go from five to six and the names go from F to T. And the metadata snippet that we now create also has this entry that we deleted something. So we added partition four and we deleted partition two and for partition two, the statistics are in there. And that's how we see kind of how basically this table evolves over time. We now have kind of these four partitions on cloud storage, plus we have these three metadata snippets. And these are kind of like a timeline of how the table evolved. And by kind of looking at them at some certain time points, we can like reconstruct tables, et cetera. So let's now take a look at how we utilize this structure of like having these metadata snippets, like this timeline uh, of metadata snippets and the uh, micro partitions on cloud storage. Oh, and obviously, as I, as I forgot to mention, while we deleted partition two here, from a logical sense, we do not delete partition two from cloud storage yet. We retain that for some time because that again, like allows us to do things like going back in time and recovering stuff. All right, so let's go through some operations now that we have like created our table. Let's say we now want to actually query it. So how does that happen? So first off, let's do a very simple select. So we select star from T. Um, how does it happen? So first, what we have to do is we have to load all of the metadata snippets for T. It says like it's at the latest state. So these are these three snippets, M1, M2, and then M3. Then we need to figure out which files do we actually need to scan. So we just go over here. So we added partitions one and two. So we need to scan them. Then we added partition three. So we need to scan one, two, and two and three. And then we added partition four. So one, two, three, and four. But we also deleted partition two. So it's one, three, and four. So those are the partitions we need to scan. And there's nothing else we need to do. So then we go and tell our execution, hey, um, dear worker, please scan partitions one, three, and four and return the result to me. So far, so good. So let's now make it a little bit more interesting and see like for what we need the metadata. So let's now say we have something like this, select star from T where ID equals five. We do the same thing. We kind of load the metadata snippets and we kind of reconstruct which partitions we need to scan. So one, three, and four. But now what we also have, we have additional information, right? We know that we are only interested in partitions that contain the ID five. So we now can take a look at the statistics that we have and see is the ID five actually contained. So for partition one, the IDs go from one to three, so five is not contained. For two, it goes from four to six, so five is contained. But remember, we deleted two, so it's actually not part of the scan set, so it's, it's not contained in our scan. Um, partition three goes from seven to seven, so uh, five is not contained. And then partition four down here goes from five to six, five is contained, so that is the only partition we need to scan, partition four. So that is kind of this, this notion that we call pruning, where you essentially use this, this rich column of metadata to, to maybe basically to skip over as many of these partitions as possible so that we can um, get good scan performance even though everything is stored <clears throat> on, on cloud storage. All right, 
time travel. So as I said um, in the beginning, or as I said earlier, these metadata snippets, they kind of form a timeline, like a progression of how the table kind of evolved over time. And that actually allows us to, to kind of replay how a table looked at a, at a certain point in time. So let's say, for instance, for the sake of the argument again, um, we had like metadata, the, the, uh, the, uh, sorry, the load operation happened at 2 p.m., the insert operation had happened at 3 p.m. and the delete operation happened, happened at 4 p.m. Let's say we're now interested in scanning the table as of 3 p.m., so as it was before we deleted the row. So for this, it's just the same as before. The only difference is we now actually discard metadata, uh, metadata snippet 3, which was added after 3 p.m. So we reconstruct which, which partitions were added, in this case, 1, 2, and 3, and those are the ones that we scan. And that kind of gives us the table state as of 3 p.m. Uh, we can obviously also combine this with pruning again. Uh, so again, like we want to scan the table at 3 p.m. and we're only interested in uh, in rows where the ID is five. So we scan the table as of 3 p.m., which means we get metadata snippets M1 and M2. M3 again happened after it, so we discard it, we ignore it, which means we have to scan partitions one, two, and three. And then again, we do pruning. And now the only file that actually has uh, values of with ID five is file two, it goes from five, four to six. So that's the only file to scan. So in that way, by kind of using this metadata information, we can basically reconstruct um, result sets and group result sets as of a certain time step. And that's also obviously why we didn't actually delete partition two uh, from cloud storage earlier. We just kind of made a note of it, like a deletion marker or something. All right, another nice thing that we can do now is, uh, is cloning a table. So cloning a table, as I said, because a table essentially is this combination of the um, like the, the actual table data in cloud storage and the meta information in the, uh, in the central key value store. So if I clone a table, it essentially just becomes a meta operation. It's a simple metadata operation. So I basically just, what I will do is I'll take all of the snippets, M1, M2, M3. I will consolidate them together because we basically clone as of the current timestamp. So it doesn't, we just kind of compact it together such that like future operations on a table are more efficient. And then we create this new metadata snippet M4 that says, well, clone like table, like the table as of this time uh, has, has partitions one, three, and four, and here are the statistics. And then we associate this metadata snippet M4 with the new table T2. And that basically means we just need to like, essentially copy the metadata information. And now we have a full clone of the table with like, uh, with, again, like copy and write semantics, uh, but they, they, they essentially share, well, essentially they share kind of the, the, the bulk of data in cloud storage. We can then also obviously combine that with, uh, with, with time travel. So if we create a clone of table T at timestamp 3 p.m., it's the same as before. It's just that we now consolidate the snippets M1 and M2, and we skip M3 because that happened after 3 p.m. And then that gives us like this new editor snippet on the right, which is our table. So how this looks like now is um, we have our table T, M1, M2, M3, which has like this progression of snippets. We have our table T2, um, which has M4, and we have partitions on cloud search part one, two, three, and four. So basically nothing changed here because of the clone. We just added a, a new, uh, metadata snippet. Now, obviously, if you would now, for instance, insert something into M4, that would add a new partition. It would delete something from M4. It would kind of add a new partition. Mark one is deleted. So at that point, they kind of bifurcate. But up until then, they basically, basically share the the bulk of the data. All right. So that was kind of the the overview on on how tables are organized in Snowflake, what they are, how we how we think about tables in terms of partitions and metadata. And also um, how we kind of how we can run certain basic operations as metadata operations um, based on kind of the structure. So let's now take a look at like a little bit more in-depth performance topic that's kind of building on top of that, which we call it, which is automatic clustering. So what is clustering? Well, clustering is kind of related to pruning. So you, as you recall, there was this, this notion of pruning where we use the rich metadata information that we have, the columnar metadata information about the zone maps to figure out whether we actually need to scan a certain file or not for a certain, uh, for a certain query. Um, we have like essentially two types of pruning in the system. So the first one is compile time pruning. That is the thing I talked that I showed up earlier. So we figure out um, for a certain predicate, we check it against the min max metadata for the file and we figure out, okay, does the file actually contain anything for this predicate or not? And if not, we can immediately discard it. Um, this is, I mean, it, it's, it's, this is clear how this works for like simple things like, I mean, where ID equals five, we just need to compare this value. It also works for more complex things. Like for instance, if you have like expression like month of date minus one equals seven, we can essentially like propagate the information, how the min and max ranges are affected by their predicate and then also prune based on these comp more complex expressions. Um, 
for some functions, obviously impossible to prune. Like if you have like a random in there that doesn't, you can't really prune against that. Uh, but for most functions, you actually like, propagate it nicely through. And this all happens at compile time. Basically, at compile time, we've used the, we, we load the, uh, the metadata, we apply this, and that's good. We also have runtime pruning. So this is where we utilize the metadata actually inside of the execution to, uh, to figure out that we can skip over certain files based on information that only becomes available during query processing. So the best example is um, like join pruning or scale scale subquery. So essentially, for instance, if we have if we have a join and we built the um, yeah, we, we built like a build site of the join that gives us now information of like the key ranges that can actually match uh, with the join. So the, assuming it's a filtering in a join. And we can now actually propagate this information downwards in the execution and use metadata at runtime to filter out further files because we know they will not survive kind of joining against whatever the table has on the left side. Now, the problem with pruning, um, and uh, I mean, that, that should be pretty obvious, is that obviously the performance that we get out of this, I mean, out of skipping files, it it depends very heavily on how the data is organized, how the data, how the table is laid out. So, as an example, <clears throat> so this table now again, like this is the example that we had like in the first part of the talk, where uh, we have like the uh, ID column, the name column. Typically, the data follows what we call a natural data clustering, which is essentially just um, like a type is clustered by time, right? And you typically insert data over time, so that basically means the table layout follows time, and the micro partitions are essentially like ordered by time. So in here, for instance, we have like one, two, three, four, five, and six. And um, if we then scan by a predicate that follows this, or, uh, this, uh, this clustering, like in this case by ID, that is great. And then, then pruning works really great because um, like it follows the organ, it, like, yeah, we can we kind of know that works. Now, the problem comes if we, if we, uh, if you filter by something that doesn't follow kind of the, the natural data layer. For instance, in this case, if we were to scan by, by name equals max. So now, if you take a look at the metadata snippets, um, A to M, M is contained, so we need to scan the first partition. B to N, M is again contained, so we also need to scan the second partition. F to T, M is contained, so we need to scan the third partition. So as you see, like just by kind of having a slightly different predicate, we suddenly have to scan the whole table versus only having to scan um, a, single, a single partition of the table. And that kind of illustrates why kind of data layout is important there. Um, <clears throat> as I said, so one kind of one interesting aside here, the natural data layout that I mentioned, so typically as it follows time, is actually quite useful for, for typical data warehousing applications because you typically always have some form of time range in there already. So just kind of by the DMLs kind of following how you query it, that typically works quite well for most customers. Now, obviously for some, it doesn't. So for those, they obviously would like to reorganize the table, right? So for this, for example, in this case, let's say we're typically more interested in scanning the table by name rather than by ID. So what we should do is we should reorganize the table by name. So in this case, we just sort it by name. Let's do the same query. Um, we scan your ID by, uh, we scan first by ID equals three. Uh, we have to scan partitions uh, one and two. And now we want to scan by max. And remember, we had with the original layout, we had to scan the whole table. Now with this layout, as you see, the only partition we have to scan is the second one because we now organize the table according to uh, the the attribute we actually query by. So this is essentially what we mean by what we call clustering at Snowflake. It is the notion that a customer can tell us, "Hey, I am accessing this table primarily via this column." or via this expression or via this combination of columns. So this is kind of my main way of accessing this, this table. So these are what we call clustering keys. These are provided by a customer. So the customer tells us, I don't know, like I'm, I'm querying this table by, let's say by zip code, or I'm querying it by uh, salary range or something like that. So it, it basically it indicates an intention from the customer that the table will primarily be queried by those keys. And what we then do with this, with this uh, information is that we automatically maintain the table organization. So we make sure that the table is organized according to these clustering keys such that when they actually run queries, they will be as efficient as possible. So in a way, when we talk about clustering in Snowflake, what we mean is we actually maintain an approximate sort order. So we reorganize partition to contain similar ranges of the clustering key. Obviously the goal is not to sort the table <clears throat> because that's not our goal. Our goal is to like guarantee good um, good pruning performance, we want to make sure the kind of keys are similar. So how does that work? Well, let's let's kind of play through a few strategies that we could use here. So A, like the most simple strategy is we could do something like periodic batch clustering. So we basically just 
sort the whole table and then rewrite it. And obviously that has some major drawbacks. A, it's extremely expensive because we have to do a full sort over kind of like, like potentially like petasized, uh, petabyte, petabyte sized tables. It also adds some latency problems because um, as we sort it, at that point, we essentially have to like, we don't really have to get a full table lock. You can still insert in the table. These are just new files, but you can't really update it because otherwise we would kind of have to restart the sort. Um, so it's not really suitable for like background operations. And also it kind of adds like these, these, these sharp edges in the performance, right? So it kind of the performance degrades and it gets worse and gets worse and gets worse. And then we manage to do like a full rebuild and then it kind of goes back up and then gets worse and gets worse and worse. So that's not great. Another idea is that we could recluster the table with incoming changes. So essentially instead of just inserting the rows at the end or something and like slowly degrading clustering performance we essentially figure out okay for each for which for like which row should go in which file then load this file insert it and rewrite it so this is good because it kind of leads to like um like a more gradual performance creep basically the the cluster will always be optimal um however the problem is that it kind of fronts load the cost of the operation to the customer dml right the dml now has to do, has to do more work and kind of the customer would have to pay for that and it makes the you know, operation slower. Plus it suffers from write amplification, which is which is bad. Um, what I mean by that is the following. So let's assume we have like a fully clustered table of IDs from, from one from zero to 100. We have like 10 files with like uh, key ranges of 10 uh, IDs each. And we now want to insert like a new file, like a new value that just kind of has a key that matches into each of these files. So suddenly a single insert becomes essentially like a full rebuild of all partitions. With like this this idea of um, of like incrementally doing it as sort of like a concluding it in the DML, so that is obviously also not great. Like you, you don't want to have, be in a situation of explaining a customer by a single insert suddenly rebuild the whole table and it took like forever. So that's not that's not an ideal uh, strategy. So instead, what we do is the following: <clears throat> we essentially incrementally and approximately recluster the table and background. So we go in and we take a look at the table state, at the metadata for the table. And we figure out, okay, which parts of the table are actually clustered the worst. And then we go in and recluster those in the background. And so this is kind of how it looks like. So as changes trickle into, into the table, uh, we trigger kind of this, um, this algorithm. The algorithm kind of works as follows. We first do a partition selection algorithm. So this is, as I said, like the idea here is we figure out which parts of the table, so which, uh, which batches of files are clustered the worst. Then we take those. Um, we uh, we recluster those batches individually in the background, and that's actually a nice thing about like having a cloud data warehouse. You can actually do this on a separate warehouse. You can like basically do all of the new computations of like rewriting and like reorganizing organizing on a separate warehouse, and then commit it later on. Which means that the customer warehouses are not uh, are not really affected, right? You you basically do everything in the background. By doing it in the background, you actually mean you do it in the background. It's like on new cloud resources, not on customer cloud resources. Um, <clears throat> we then uh, yeah, we said then we cluster these batches and then we commit them back into the table. Uh, here we can use an optimistic commit. So we basically uh, just assume nothing has happened. If something has happened, we just discard the batch and start again. It doesn't really matter too much. These batches are small. Um, and then we just keep looping in that until kind of the, uh, the clustering is, is good enough. So obviously the interesting part here is this partition selection algorithm. So how do we actually figure out how for like first of all how do we measure clustering uh, cluster clustering quality and then also how do we figure out which batches we actually want to cluster so let's take a look at like this this partition selection algorithm uh, to explain that a bit so <clears throat> sorry my <coughs> my voice is breaking so um how does this work well this is all obviously driven by the file metadata that we have and in particular what we do is we take a look at some metrics uh, and one probably like the most important metric that we look at is what we call the clustering depth so the clustering depth the idea is, is fairly simple so on the, on the right side what you see here is the is the key value range or the value range for the clustering key and then so let's say it goes from 1 to 100 and then the blue lines in the middle are actual files so we have one file that goes from 18 to 78 we have one file that goes from 27 to 100. We have one file that goes from 30 to 35. And now the clustering depth is measured at particular points in like the value range. So for instance, and it then measures essentially how many files overlap for this point. So in a way it measures um, how many files do we actually need to scan if we were interested in that particular key. So for instance, for if we were interested in querying 20, 
we have only a single overlap. It's only the first file, right? So that means we only have to scan one file. So the clustering depth for the key 20 is one. Uh, for 70, we overlap with two files, right? 80 to 78 and 27 to 100. So we say for for uh, for, uh, for 70, the clustering depth is two because we need to scan two files. And now for 32, we overlap with all three files. So from 18 to 78, 27 to 100, 30 to 35. So we have to scan three files and the clustering depth is three. So in a way, the clustering depth, in particular, like the worst case type clustering depth, kind of the, the maximum clustering depth gives us like, a, like an upper bound on, or actually like a lower bound, on how many files we need to scan. At worst, if we had like, if we were like, if we were like creating by the clustering key. So that is kind of the intuition behind the partition selection algorithm. We want to reduce the worst case clustering depth. We kind of want to minimize that as much as like, as much as possible, obviously, we lower an acceptable threshold. We, will, we don't want to have like just like single row files. It would be insane as well, uh, or single value files. Um, and that kind of will give us predictable query performance. And the nice thing is we can actually measure the clustering depth very easily based on the file metadata that we have, because we always have these min-max ranges for, for our clustering keys, right? Um, let's give an intuition. So let's say, for instance, here again, we have the clustering value range on the x-axis and we have the clustering depth on the y-axis. So each of these like little, uh, little lines represents a file. So the min-max range, so the range of values in that file. And we see, for instance, here, we would have <clears throat> essentially two peaks, right? We have like, uh, well, three peaks. One on the left, one on the right, and one in the middle. So intuitively, what we want to do is, let's say we have some form of threshold. We say, well, we want to achieve like this depth because then we can guarantee that that scans always finish in, in, I don't know, like X seconds or so. And what we then have to do is we have to figure out where are the parts of kind of the, the value range that exceed this depth. And then once we do that, we have to figure out, okay, which are these what we call peaks? And then we identify the files that belong to these peaks. And then we essentially just recluster those batches. So we take these batches, these peak batches, we cluster them and write them back. Uh, the details are a bit more involved, but essentially it's, it's fairly simple. Uh, you, you kind of take all of your metadata ranges <clears throat> for the clustering key. You sort them by the endpoints because the endpoints essentially always when like the depth will change, right? left to right so that's where these are points in the in the value domain where something changes uh then you compute peak ranges by essentially just keeping like a stabbing count array and calculating for each addition endpoint the depth and then you just keep like a um I mean max priority queue over there to figure out where are kind of the worst parts uh, the worst peaks and that also gives you the list of partitions that way we can kind of um select that there are there are some other concerns here to take to, take, uh, to think about. So, for instance, um, it's not enough to just say, "Well, we reduced the depths," because if you just go by that metric, you will actually um, you might actually make things worse. So, for instance, uh, let's go back to this example here. So, let's say we wanted to like re-optimize this batch, right? Because it has like a it has a clustering depth of three. So we want to re we basically rebuild these three files. What it would mean is we would probably like take these files and then sort them and then write three new files, which probably have like um, I don't know, like let's say from 18 to 30, from 30 to 50, and from 50 to 100 or something like that. The problem is if you take a look at the third file, which goes from 30 to 35, right? Which is like a it's a very, it's a very well condensed file. It only has like five different keys in there. This is actually like a really nice thing to have. If you only have like a very small amount of keys in a file, that means um, this will prune about away really, really well. Now, if you merge, if you just took this batch here and reconstructed it, suddenly you would have like three files with wider ranges. So while you then might reduce the, the, the depth, actually, you also produced cases where suddenly the clustering becomes worse because suddenly your, your key range is, uh, is, is bigger. So um, because of that, there are some other metrics that we take into account. So it's not just the clustering depth. We also, for instance, take a look at kind of the width of the files. And we make sure that we only cluster files with like similar widths because then you can kind of by width, I mean kind of the, the difference between the min and the max value, because that then gives you like uh, typically good clustering quality, and, and you don't you don't degrade over time. And in the end, what you then end up with is, is some form of, I mean, in a way, it's like an LSM structure where you first have like very wide, basically you have newly inserted data, which is probably very wide, and then you kind of do these depth based clustering on on the peaks for the newly inserted data, and that kind of gives uh, 
gives you like smaller files that you then kind of merge with the smaller files from the base table. And then kind of you merge them with the even smaller files and merge, merge table in like multiple steps up to up. Uh, up to that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and there were actually supposed to be some slides to explain that. I don't know why they didn't show up. So sorry for uh, having to do that without slides. Okay, so let's come back to like automatic clustering and how it works at Snowflake. So in the end, the idea is simple, like as data arrives, obviously our clustering quality goes down. So we want to wake up as new data arrives. We then want to measure well, how bad is the clustering state, which we do by kind of looking at this, um, at the depth, basically the, the overlap of files um, in, in the value range. Did we then kind of run, uh, yeah, yeah, these levels, which is the one, okay. <laughs> we then uh, identify batches based on various metrics, particularly like the depth and the width that I talked about. Um, we send these batches for reclustering and for execution in the background warehouse. The warehouse will sort these batches, write them back, and do an optimistic commit. Um, and then over time, the, um, the clustering quality of the table improves. All right, that was my talk. And here's like the obvious uh, we are hiring slide. So um, we are obviously hiring all the time. We are having, we, are, uh, we always have a, oh, sorry. <laughs> we are hiring bachelor students, master students, PhD students, software engineers with like experience across like our five engineering hubs. So we have uh, San Mateo, uh, Bellevue, Berlin, Toronto, and Warsaw. Uh, obviously in, I'm from Berlin, so I'm working uh, with, with a large team in Berlin on primarily query execution aspects on, but also on like service aspects and the latency aspects. Other teams uh, in Bellevue and San Mateo are working, for instance, on compilers, on, on uh, data, on metadata management. So there, it's a it's a massive system. It's a really interesting, um, like a really interesting product because we have so many customers using it. We're running a service. You can kind of see how people are actually using a database system, which is really really cool. It's just something that you typically don't see in academia. Um, so if you're interested in any of this, if you're interested in running really like one of the biggest largest data warehouses in the world, let me know um, or look, on, up, look up on our website and uh, hopefully we, we hear from someone. So, and with that, I'm opening up for questions. Thanks, uh, Max. That's a really interesting uh, talk. 